Uh, hola, buenos dias. Uh, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Okay, great. Um, um, good morning. So what, what I want to do is just um, start by defining fermentation. What is fermentation anyway? Um, you know, why is it practiced in every part of the world? Um, how does it transform food? And just give kind of a, a broad overview of, uh, of, of fermentation. Um, the way I would typically define fermentation in a culinary context like this is fermentation is the transformative action of microorganisms. Biologists would already, would already be shaking their heads because biologists understand fermentation a little bit differently. For a biologist, fermentation describes the production of energy without oxygen, anaerobic metabolism. Um, you know, and, 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 and actually most of the foods and beverages that we describe as fermented meet the biologist's definition. Um, uh, you know, when, when, when we make kimchi or sauerkraut out of uh, cabbages and radishes, this is an anaerobic process that does not require oxygen. When we make yogurt out of milk, that's an anaerobic process that does not require oxygen. Um, when we make wine from grapes, that's an anaerobic process that does not require oxygen. The, the problem is that, you know, some of the foods and beverages that we eat and drink that are produced by um, the transformative action of microorganisms do require oxygen. So, for instance, to make vinegar requires oxygen. To make kombucha requires oxygen. Um, certain styles of cheese require oxygen. Um, so, uh, you know, I think of these as the um, uh, uh, oxymoronic ferments because they contradict the biologist's understanding of fermentation. They require oxygen. So, for this reason, I like to work with a broader lay definition that fermentation is the transformative action of microorganisms. But of course, you know, we must recognize that not every transformative action of microorganisms results in something delicious that we wish to put into our mouths. Um, and um, you know, all of us are familiar with the transformative action of microorganisms you know, from when we clean the refrigerator and the things that we find in the back of the refrigerator that were forgotten about. Um, and, uh, but, but we don't describe, you know, these things that we find when we clean the refrigerator, we don't describe them as fermented. We have a different vocabulary. Um, you know, in English we call these things, you know, rotten or, 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 or spoiled. And we reserve the word fermentation to describe intentional or desirable microbial transformations. But I think the fact that all of us inevitably um, you know, find food decomposing in the back of the refrigerator or, or in the pantry, um, uh, you know, tells us a little bit about the inevitability of microbial transformation of our food. And what we now understand in the 21st century, which was not always obvious to people in the time before microbiology, is that you know, all of the things that make up our food, all of the plants and all of the animal products that people eat, are populated by elaborate communities of microorganisms. And you know, unless the food is dried, depriving the microorganisms of the water that they need in order to function, or unless the food is frozen uh, uh, at a temperature so low that none of the microorganisms can function, then you know, eventually there is a certain inevitability to microbial transformation of our food. And um, you know, fermentation traditions all around the world are um, strategies for guiding the microbial transformation of the food. So instead of having the food decompose into something disgusting that nobody would want to eat, we guide it into some sort of practical benefit, either the production of alcohol or making food more stable for uh, uh, storage and preservation or simply making food more delicious, 
or making food more easily digestible. So there's always some practical benefit that we gain instead of having the food decompose into an ugly uh, uh, mess. There's always a, a, a benefit to fermentation. Um, I certainly do not possess um, um, uh, 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 an encyclopedic knowledge of food traditions. But um, as far as I can tell, um, fermentation is a part of every culinary tradition around the world. Um, I have been looking for counterexamples for more than 20 years, and every time somebody has suggested a, a part of the world or a culinary tradition that does not incorporate fermentation, um, I have been able to find an example of fermentation uh, 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 that is traditionally practiced in, in, in that part of the world. And, you know, if you think about it with our current knowledge of microbiology and our understanding of the simple fact that all biological creations are host to um, you know uncountable numbers of, of different bacteria um, you know there, there there is simply this inevitability to microbial transformation of, of our food and I mean nobody understood you know um, um, the uh, what was happening during fermentation really until Louis Pasteur did his work 150 years ago. That was the first time that, you know, specific microorganisms were um, um, identified and, um, uh, and we began to learn about the specific transformations that different uh, uh, types of organisms can um, 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 uh, uh, um, achieve with, 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 with the food. Um, so, um, uh, you know, there, fermentation is practiced everywhere simply because all of the plants and animal products that make up our food are populated by uh, elaborate communities of microorganisms. And so the big question becomes, which of these organisms are going to grow? Um, and, I, and I would say that the practice of fermentation amounts to um, simple manipulations of environmental conditions which encourage the growth of certain kinds of organisms while simultaneously discouraging the growth of other types of organisms. So for instance, um, um, you know, imagine a cabbage, a, a head of cabbage. Um, and this is a very important food that is fermented in many different parts of the world and it gives us sauerkraut and it gives us different varieties of cabbage, give us kimchi and you know, many, many other uh, uh, traditions. But so, you know, if we just take that, ca the, the cabbage, like any other food that we eat, is covered by you know, un uncountable different types of microorganisms. And, you know, if we just chop up the cabbage and leave it sitting in a bowl for three weeks, it is not going to turn itself into sauerkraut. Um, and what will happen instead is very predictable, which is that molds will grow. Um, and, you know, if, uh, uh, um, uh, if you leave a whole bowl of chopped cabbage, the, 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 the cabbage will become engulfed by mold, and the mold will reduce the cabbage into a little puddle of slime that bears no resemblance whatsoever to delicious, tangy, crunchy sauerkraut. Um, and, um, you know, it's just because the, you know, the wrong organism grew, the, the molds grew. So, you know, the, the strategy for fermenting sauerkraut is to, um, you know, protect the cabbage from air with oxygen, um, and we do that by getting the vegetables submerged. And those of you who come to the workshop this afternoon will see how incredibly simple that is. We just get the vegetables under juice, you know, under cabbage juice or under salt water. It doesn't matter which way. Both ways, we're protecting the cabbage from the air and the oxygen. And so then the molds can't grow. And what grows instead are lactic acid bacteria. Um, and they're what create the flavor, they're what, um, you know, protect the cabbage from uh, the growth of random bacteria that could make us sick. 
um, and they're what really preserve the form of the vegetables, is, is the, the, the lactic acid that's produced by, by these, these bacteria. But the same food under different environmental conditions can develop very, very differently. And all of the practices of fermentation um, you know, amount to manipulations of environmental conditions. So for instance, you know, in the production of wine, typically you want to protect the wine from oxygen because you know, if the wine has prolonged contact with oxygen, then that will support the growth of bacteria that will transform the wine into vinegar. If you wish to make vinegar, then you need to have a broad surface area with lots of access to oxygen. But if you don't want it to turn into vinegar, if you want to keep it wine, then you need to protect it from oxygen and seal it in a bottle or during the fermentation, um, you know, have, uh, um, um, you know, some uh, um, means by which the carbon dioxide that's produced can escape without the oxygen from the atmosphere getting in, which would support organisms that would um, um, turn it in, in, into vinegar. So there's always these um, you know, attempts to um, you know, uh, uh, um, control environmental conditions to some degree in order to guide which of the organisms are going to grow. Um, you know, let me talk about some of the ways that, that, that the fermentation transforms food. Um, I mean, first let's talk about preservation. I mean, for us in 2016, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to imagine food preservation in the past. You know, we all have a refrigerator. Um, um, and, and we really can't even imagine, you know, what to do with perishable food products without refrigeration. You know, then, you know, we might be familiar with, um, uh, you know, another method of preserving food without refrigerator. If we were having this conversation 100 years ago, nobody would have a refrigerator. But then maybe you would be thinking, oh, canning. We, we, you know, we have this technology for sterilizing food inside of a jar, and that's an old method of food preservation, and that's a... A little bit old, but you know the 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 the, the technology of sterilizing food inside of a jar is a 200-year-old technology that was invented in France uh, by um, 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 oh my God I forgot his name um, uh, Apert Nicolas Apert and in France they still call canning apertization because they remember the name of this uh, of this clever man but. Um, um, you know, before, before 1812, there was no canning, sterilizing food in a jar. So if you take away refrigerators and freezers and you take away sterilizing food inside of a jar, there are not many ways that people use to preserve food. We can dry food. Dried food is preserved simply by depriving the microorganisms of the um, uh, water that they need in order to function. And then the other traditional way of preserving food is through fermentation. Um, and so, you know, cheese is really ultimately a strategy for preserving milk. So is yogurt and kefir and all of the styles of uh, fermented milk that people um, uh, eat in different parts of the world. You know, the, the, the practical benefit of this, the original practical benefit of this is a, it's a strategy for preserving milk. Um, you know, if you look at, you know, salamis and other kinds of cured meats, these are strategies for preserving meat. If you look at um, you know, sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, um, you know, these are all strategies for preserving uh, um, um, vegetables. But um, you know, in the past, fermentation has been an essential um, um, uh, method to enable people, particularly in temperate climates with limited growing seasons, to preserve food from seasons of relative abundance to feed people through the seasons of relative scarcity. So, um, you know, foods like, foods like sauerkraut and kimchi are survival foods in the you know, context in which they um, um, originally uh, uh, evolved. Um, you know, beyond preservation, I, I should just talk about flavor because flavor is what got me interested in fermentation in the first place. And um, I mean, I, gr I grew up in New York City and my family would always go to this uh, um, uh, uh, gourmet food store uh, um, uh, near us to, to, buy, um, uh, uh, to buy pickles, to buy cheeses, um, to buy cured meats. And then as an adult, I walked into that same store and I looked around and they sell coffee and they sell chocolate 
and I realized everything that they sell in this store is fermented. And, you, and that's true of you know, gourmet food stores in every part of the world. Most of the food that people um, you know, elevate on a pedestal like this, that people transport around the world, that people will pay exorbitant prices for, you know, the foods that we call gourmet foods are almost all products of fermentation. And it's because fermentation creates these compelling flavors, these strong, unforgettable flavors. But of course, you know, not everybody loves every flavor of fermentation. Um, and um, you know, I would say in general, the flavors of fermentation are flavors that we could describe as acquired tastes. Um, they're a little bit edgy. Not everybody loves every flavor of fermentation especially some of the, you know, let's say very, um, um, you know, ripe, strong cheeses. Some people find them scary. They remind some people of decomposition. Um, you know, sometimes I've invited people to my house to share, um, you know, some beautiful, very strong, very ripe cheese, and always somebody will stop at the door and make a face, and they will say, did something die in here? Um, and, you know, for them, th this is a smell, this is a flavor that, like, they would never consider putting into their mouths because it's just, it's, it's too disturbing to them. Um, and, and, and fermentation creates a lot of these kind of edgy flavors that are not immediately accessible to everybody. Um, you know, if we were to go to the Arctic and eat the, um, uh, uh, the fish that, that, that really is what enables human beings to live in that harsh climate, is in the summertime when the waterways are accessible, they catch lots of fish, and then they put them in pits in the ground, or sometimes just mounds on, the, on, on top of the, the ground. Um, and then in the cold, they, they freeze, in the warm weather, they ferment, and this is the survival food that enables people to live in that harsh climate. But by every account I've ever read of somebody who did not grow up eating that kind of fermented fish, you know, if you're, you know, 35 years old and you go for the first time to visit, you know, Siberia or Alaska or Greenland and, um, you know, are confronted by these kinds of, um, um, you know, half decomposed fermented fish that, that, that people eat, um, you know, most people would find it just completely um, um, inaccessible. Um, uh, you know, they're... they're so much of you know, our notions of what kinds of flavors are acceptable for us to eat are a result of what we have been exposed to. Um, um, uh, you know, often the question comes up, you know, where, where is the dividing line between food that is fermented to perfection and food that is rotting? And all I can tell you is that science has not provided us with a sharp, line dividing the two. And there is a large subjective element um, um, really based on, on acculturation, what we've been exposed to, what we are used to. Um, and, you know, sometimes uh, 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 foods that, you know, in one cultural context might be considered, you know, the, 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 the highest expression of gastronomy Somebody who's never been exposed to that food could, could come upon that food and just, you know, just find it disgusting and, and, and make it, and, and, and like it's something that they would never consider putting into their mouths. So, you know, it's just, there, there, there's a highly subjective um, um, aspect to it. And I think for, for Western audiences, cheese is the way people can understand that because, you know, some of us, um, uh, you know, most of us have been exposed to cheese throughout our lives. Some of us uh, only like some kinds of styles of cheese and other styles of cheese we find to be just, you know, too, too, too strong. They, 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 they scare us too much, but around the world you find a lot of this. Um, you know, there's a, there's a fermented fish that people in Sweden uh, uh, eat called surströmming. It's a low-salt fermented herring. Um, but, you know, they, the, the, the Swedish people often like to, um, um, you know, try to get foreigners to taste it. And their expectation is, if you didn't grow up in Sweden, you're not going to like surströmming. Um, but, but, but it actually, it seems to give people special pleasure 
to watch their foreign friends um, uh, you know, reject this food because it reinforces their sense of cultural identity. Um, you know that, that that they can all enjoy this food, but most people who are outside of their culture find it so um, um, inaccessible. And I think you know if we were to um, uh, you know may, maybe this is something that, that that's happened at the Basque Culinary Center. But if you bring in a team of chefs from let's say a part of the world where milk and cheese have not been part of the culinary palate, and you present them with um, you know a, 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 a European cheese plate, um, you know mostly you know they will they will regard that as rotten milk. Um, and and not be able to sort of you know appreciate the you know all of the different um, um, you know flavors and, and textures that, that are part of it. It's just because uh, you know fermentation creates such an extraordinary range of um, you know flavors and uh, and textures really in in, in food. Um, beyond flavor, I, I want to address nutrition. Um, because one reason why many people are getting interested in fermentation at the present time is um, uh, you know, the perceived nutritional benefits. So I want to talk a little bit about how fermentation transforms foods nutritionally. And it's hard to generalize. It's not as if you know, chocolate and salami and sauerkraut and coffee all have the same nutritional qualities. I mean, fermented foods are, are, are extraordinarily varied, you know, as are the, you know, the, the foods that you're fermenting. And by the way, there is no food that cannot be fermented. I mean, no food that can uh, uh, nourish us uh, uh, could not be fermented. Everything we can eat can be fermented. Um, uh, uh, so, um, I would say that, that the process of fermentation transforms foods nutritionally in, in four distinct ways. Uh, uh, the first way I would call pre-digestion. And this is the idea that while the food is fermenting, nutrients are being broken down into simpler um, um, and often more easily accessible forms. Um, you know, I would say that the food, the food that um, illustrates this most vividly is the soybean. Um, uh, um, you know, the, the reason why, you know, in many of the vegetarian subcultures of the West, the soybean became the center of the diet, uh, the, the reason for that is simply that soybeans are the plant source food considered to have the most concentrated protein. But you never hear about people, uh, you know, sitting down and eating a big bowl of uh, uh, fresh soybeans for dinner. Um, and, uh, you know, the way you might with, 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 with some other kinds of beans. Um, and the reason for this is that our human digestive systems are not capable of digesting soybeans. If you, ate, if you sat and ate a big bowl of soybeans for dinner, you know, you would have indigestion um, and gas, but you would not get all of the protein, and it's simply because of limitations of our human digestive system. Um, the, the Asian cultures that pioneered soy agriculture developed all of these different ways of fermenting uh, uh, the soybeans. So, um, you know, if you, if you travel across Asia, you, you find just an extraordinary range of different, you know, styles of fermented soybeans. They're, they're different in their flavors, they're different in their textures, um, uh, they're different in their fermentation methods, they're different in the starter cultures that they use, but what they all have in common is that the protein gets broken down into amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. This is pre-digestion, the idea that you know, a dense compound nutrient gets broken down during the fermentation into simpler forms that are more easily accessible by us. Um, similarly, lactose, the sugar in milk that so many people have a hard time digesting, um, lactose is broken down by fermentation into lactic acid, and the longer the cheese or the yogurt ferments, the more of the lactose gets, uh, gets, gets broken down. Uh, even gluten, the, um, uh, uh, the protein in wheat and some other grains that so many people are having a hard time digesting, gluten is broken down by fermentation, not by yeast, which is you know what's used in most contemporary breads, but in but by bacteria, gluten is broken down by bacteria. So when you take a um, you know a, um, if, when you take some wheat and make bread with it using natural leavening, which involves yeast, but also lactic acid bacteria, um, 
the lactic acid bacteria break down a lot of the gluten that's in the wheat during the fermentation. So this is, this is pre-digestion. And by the way, like uh, the idea of pure yeast, you know, any kind of singular microorganism, you know, that's a human technological achievement since the time of Louis Pasteur 150 years ago. Louis Pasteur is the first person who ever isolated a microorganism. Microorganisms are everywhere but never singularly. You never in the natural world find single microorganisms. Microorganisms exist in communities, in our bodies, um, on all the food that we eat, and everywhere around us. But they never exist singularly, except through, um, uh, you know, sort of human technological means of, of isolating uh, 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 um, individual organisms. So, um, so in pre-digestion, the bacteria that always travel along with yeast uh, you know, actually can even digest gluten uh, uh, itself. Um, so then the, the, the flip side of pre-digestion is detoxification. And the, the many foods, um, you know, uh, many products of agriculture, um, uh, you know, in their raw form contain compounds that are um, uh, potentially toxic. So for instance, uh, uh, many vegetables um, contain oxalic acid. Oxalic acid gets broken down uh, uh, during the fermentation. Um, uh, grains uh, uh, and, uh, and, and beans and any kind of a food that's a seed um, has a certain toxic compounds in the outer layer of, of the grains, um, including uh, some chemical bonds called phytate bonds that lock up the minerals and make the minerals in the food inaccessible to us. Fermentation, um, you know, breaks down those bonds, makes the minerals accessible to us, digests the oxalic acid. Certain foods are actually quite poisonous without processing. So, for instance, um, um, cassava, yuca. Um, um, in, in certain soils, notably in West Africa, um, cassava grows with these extraordinarily high levels of cyanide. And if people were to try to eat raw cassava roots um, um, in those parts of the world, they would kill them. So, uh, you know, in West Africa, where, where um, cassava is actually a very important food, um, you know, people typically peel it, chop it up into pieces, put it in a bucket, cover it with water. The water initiates a fermentation that breaks down the cyanide and makes this otherwise extremely uh, a poisonous food safe to, to eat. So, so this is detoxification. Then beyond breaking down nutrients or toxins that are in the food that we're talking, that, 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 that we start with, fermentation actually generates additional nutrients. Almost all fermented foods and beverages have uh, elevated B vitamin values compared to the raw foods you begin with. And, um, you know, unique micronutrients that we're just beginning to investigate and understand. But um, um, sauerkraut, kimchi, and other fermented vegetables have these compounds that are called isothiocyanates. Don't worry about translating that one. Um, um, which, which, uh, you know, they, they, they were already recognized by cancer researchers as anti-carcinogenic compounds. Um, so, so fermentation just, cr you know, creates a lot of additional um, um, compounds in the food, you know, some of which um, um, are being found to have um, special uh, uh, therapeutic uh, uh, potential. But what I would say the most uh, profound benefit of fermentation uh, uh, is are the bacteria themselves. So, you know, contrary to the indoctrination that most of us have received, um, you know, um, um, uh, um, growing up, that bacteria are bad, uh, that we need to avoid bacteria, that we, when, when we encounter bacteria, we need to destroy them, um, it turns out that, uh, you know, bacteria are the building blocks of all life. Um, uh, evolutionary biologists are coming to the conclusion that, you know, we, like all life, are descended from bacteria. And the flip side of that is that we, like every form of life, have never lived without bacteria. As multicellular life evolved from bacteria, they always brought bacteria with them. And in our human bodies, each of us is host to something like one trillion bacteria, and, um, and these bacteria are not freeloaders and they're not parasites. They actually give us 
our functionality. So, you know, we rely on bacteria to effectively digest food. <laughs> 